Knicks point guard Derrick Rose was seen at shoot-around and then went missing from the team Monday without permission, but later reached team officials telling them he had a family situation and had returned to his hometown of Chicago, sources telling ESPN. Now, Rose missed Monday night's loss to the Pelicans, and the Knicks had grown concerned enough earlier to check on him at his apartment, sources telling us. Now, Rose spoke with reporters Tuesday, saying he told head coach Jeff Hornacek of his absence on Monday. That was a family issue. Um, for one, it had nothing to do with the team or basketball, but um, that's the first time I ever felt like that emotionally and I had to be with my family. The first thing I thought of was just getting out there. So I, I really didn't think about nothing else. I explained to my teammates, I didn't want any distractions. I apologized to them earlier, just letting them know that it never happened again. But I put that on myself with not telling the Knicks and it was just bad timing, you know, but I'm not perfect, far from it. I want to be here just playing in New York, playing on the, one of the biggest stages in the world, if not the biggest stage. Just being in the city, it just motivates you, so I get it. So is it fair to say it was family first and then your occupation second in this case? Yeah, for sure, um, but that's just who I am. That's how I was raised. Well, the good news is Rose is okay. He was fine, but the Knicks didn't disclose the amount. New York faces the 76ers in Philly tonight. Rose will be in uniform. Stephen A., should he be starting? No, he should not. Not only should he not be starting, he should not be playing tonight. Matter of fact, I think what he did warranted, warranted suspension. Um, I wouldn't care if they sent him home for a few days to spend as much time with his family as he needed. Um, and that's not to diminish what's going on. Um, I know Derrick Rose a little bit. Certainly know his brother Reg. Uh, his family's wonderful. Good people. Nice people. Whatever problems that exist... I'm quite sure are very, very real to Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose is not faking it, Max. Um, he's not a liar. He's not somebody like that. He doesn't come across as that kind of dude. That's not what this is about. This is about the fact that a grown man who is a professional, who is being paid handsomely to be a professional, on more than a few occasions has exhibited behavior that is nothing short of juvenile. That's what this comes down to. And when you look at it from that perspective, to sit up there and say, well, you didn't want to be a distraction to your team. Well, your teammates wondering where you are because you didn't even call anybody to tell them that you wouldn't even be making the game, to have the organization looking at you, to have dudes wondering whether or not something had actually happened to you. Now, Max, as you have indicated on many occasions, you know I speak to people. Well, of course I've spoken to people for the New York Knicks organization. You had dudes who were actually worried that something had happened to him because they didn't hear from him. Then nobody heard anything from him. And when somebody has to send, I know I had a coach call me last night about something that happened a couple of years ago where they were looking for a player and the player hadn't shown up. And they initially was going to leave him, but a sixth cent said, no, don't leave. Have security go and check on him. Come to find out, they sent security. This dude is laid out butt naked, practically tied up because he had gone out the night before and some women drugged him and robbed him, okay? So Lord knows nobody knew what had happened to him until security went there and got him. So these kind of things happen to players. They've been robbed, they've been mugged, you know, they've been, I know of players uh, that guys, they've been held at gunpoint. I know of instances like this. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what happened to Derrick Rose. You couldn't pick up the phone and call, you just get up and leave and fly to Chicago and have the New York Knicks looking for you? That is unacceptable at the highest level. It warrants a suspension. He should not even be starting. He should be suspended. Should Derrick Rose remain on the Knicks after this year? No. Okay, we agree about that. And therefore, he must start tonight. As a matter of fact, for the next several weeks, and up until the trade deadline, what I would do if I were the Knicks is he would be the featured guy in the offense. First of all, he's still a, a almost an average NBA point guard, which is saying something. You got to be better than average. I don't know what you can, you can't name fifteen dudes better than no, him. No, no, I'm saying, but that doesn't mean I'm saying he averages seventeen a game. That's better than average. Well, I'm just saying as a point guard position, it's okay. like saying an average quarterback. It's okay. so competitive that if you are league average, you got value. I'm not saying he's a bum. Okay, he can play. He can play. But he can look as though, he can be made to look as though he's better than he actually is to increase trade value. Okay. And what I would do if I were the Knicks, since they need to clean house, they need to trade everyone not named Chris Stapp's Porzingis. 
They need to get out of that Joe Kim Noah contract, which was a terrible contract, and everyone knew it when they handed it to him, but they figured Noah with Derrick Rose is something. Now that you know Derrick Rose is not part of the long-term solution, and you got to get out of the Noah contract, mm -hmm. and you got to move Carmelo at this point, right. you have to do whatever you can to inflate the value of your assets. And if Derrick Rose still has the skills to look better than he is if he's featured in the offense, I would start him, I'd play him a ton of minutes, I'd pump up his value, and I'd try to get out of all the contracts I'm in. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think you're wrong as to whether or not that should impact the immediate decision based on his transgression. What I'm saying to you is that once he came back from the suspension, I'm all in with what Max Kellerman is saying. My issue is, is that for the moment at hand, whether it's for one game or three games, for the moment at hand, what you want to do is send a message to the players and the organization that this kind of stuff from a cultural perspective is not tolerated. We're not giving anybody a pass. You don't want to compromise it just because you're trying to elevate his trade value. Once he gets back on the court and plays 30 plus games for the rest of the season, that will determine his value in the free agency and beyond. But what you don't do is give this transgression a pass. Max, a teenager, a teenager, Max, knows to pick up the phone and call your boss, even if you're lying. Come up with an excuse. Yo, I can't make it to work today. Here's the reason why. You cannot excuse that in any way. I respect that point of view. I respect your point of view. That's a legitimate point of view. Um, the culture of the Knicks, believe it or not now, is better than it's been in a long time. And it's still sorry enough that he will not be suspended. He will start the very next game. I mean, this is the franchise you're dealing with. I, I will say this to you. I would make the argument Mike Woodson, when he was coach of the Knicks, briefly, the culture yeah. there briefly, the coach, uh, the coach of the New York Knicks then was better than what it is now. Or when D'Antoni had Jeremy Lin balling okay, for a, a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just saying, Phil ain't had it. It's not the best situation now. So I'm saying. Let's leave it there. Quote, I go to my white grandparents' house and then I cross the railroad tracks and hang out with my black grandma. Being mixed allows me to connect with everyone. Being biracial and being from the country, I can talk to guys like Travis Frederick from Wisconsin and Doug Free from Wisconsin. And then I can go over and talk to Des Bryant. I mean, think about the two different standpoints. You need to have a real conversation with both to really understand what they've been through. I don't think many can do that for me. It's not hard. Then an anonymous white Cowboys player backed up Dak's comments on his ability to connect. Quote, not to crap on Tony Romo because he's done so much for this team. But no matter how hard he'll try, there are just some things that he can't do, some ways that he can't connect with some of the guys in here like Dak can. Now, Stephen A., I find this very interesting because I've heard a lot of biracial people say in the past they didn't feel accepted by either group, and now he's looking at this as an advantage. Is Dak possibly right here? I think he's possibly right. I'm no, I, I can't say definitively per se, but I think he's possibly right. And, and just to be as forthcoming as I can possibly be, I can somewhat relate. My grandmother was white. Uh, God rest her soul. Um, she was a wonderful woman. No one has ever loved me more. She was a white woman. Uh, my mother comes from a mixed marriage. And being in that environment and allow and, and ingratiating yourself with somebody of a different hue, of a different ethnicity, and them doing the same, ultimately there's a comfort level and there's a level of communication that you're able to have. And it's not to say that somebody would you know, that doesn't come from a biracial background can't do it. Let's not insult people like that. It's just that the level of comfort that you have, uh, it's undeniable because there's a familiarity mm -hmm. when you're speaking to folks. You know, that's why I always laugh. You know, that's how I know that I've been a damn good journalist in my career because I got black folks calling me sellout half the time and I got white folks calling me racist all the time. So I know I'm right down the middle. I'm, I'm fair-minded and that's what I pride myself in being. But that's where it comes from, because I know I'm from the streets of New York City and I know I'm a brother. But at the same time, I also recognize that one of the people in this world that loved me better than anybody on the planet was a white woman who happened to be my grandma. And so as a result, when I'm communicating with folks of a different ethnicity, there is a comfort level that I have. There isn't there isn't I don't walk into a situation with preconceived notions and beliefs about who somebody is 
just because of the color of their skin. I have to hear them open their mouth. I have to witness their behavior. I have to see how they conduct themselves before I pass judgment, as opposed to being predisposed to believing something about them. And I think that's what Dak Prescott is saying here. And if you have that kind of attitude, Max, I think that helps you communicating in a locker room. People, people are formed by their experiences. It is reasonable to say that uh, someone from uh, mixed ethnicity or racial background will be attuned differently to and sensitive differently to, to other people of different backgrounds, maybe than someone who isn't. I don't think that's unreasonable. By the way, see Obama, Barack, yeah. right? Like, this is not, this is, and, and yeah. by the way, other athletes, we were just talking about the Yankees, Derek Jeter, for example. Yes. Um, and so I think, sure, that's, that's not unreasonable to talk about. And we live in such a uh, politically correct and sensitive time, especially with social media, that these topics are sometimes difficult to discuss publicly because if you don't do it at a PhD level, uh, you know, if you're not up on the latest scholarship, one wrong word and people are afraid to be kind of caught up in a controversy, yeah, don't I just know making it. an observation that maybe they didn't articulate perfectly or they were not was not fully formed or if it was fully formed was wrong headed in some way. They're not able to even make observations publicly that they feel comfortable about. So I, I accept all that. I also think that. There's a generational thing here in that Cowboys Absolutely. locker room. Mm -hmm. Tony yeah. Romo's an old guy. Yeah. He's from a different generation than these young players. Dak Prescott is of their generation, and maybe partly because of his of his uh, ethnic or racial makeup, is is a, is. A, you, I mean, if you if he wants to think that, or someone else wants to think that, okay, maybe there's truth to it. Is has these is preternaturally gifted in terms of leadership abilities. Yeah. And so these young guys feel comfortable following him because he is one of them. Not just in terms of his racial identity, but in terms of his age. Absolutely. Yeah, but be clear, we're only bringing up the racial identity element because he brought it mm -hmm. up. Sure. Yeah, yeah. and, and that's, I agree with, with both of you. I think the one thing about Dak Prescott is that, you know, it is about experiences. And his life experience has been on both sides of the railroad track, like he said. But going into a locker room, and if a locker room was just a microcosm of society, I mean, if, if you're a person outside of the locker room that's you know, biracial, you, there is a relationship there. And when you get into the locker room itself, you better have thick skin regardless of what race you are on both sides of the aisle. I think Dak is a guy that can walk over to a Des Bryant and talk the lingo like Des would talk. From, uh, from parts of Texas. I mean, it's just the way he relates to you. And then he goes over to, to Travis Frederick and does the same thing. He is that guy because of, the, of his experiences as a whole. But I think it's the makeup of Dak that's able to accept certain things that goes on in the locker room. Well, I love I think that's the biggest thing because there's some players that were biracial that I played with. They're either going one way or they're going the other. Mm -hmm. right. That's just through life experiences. This guy, you walk in that locker room, he is by far, and I keep on hearing Romo, if Dak doesn't play well, well, Romo's going to come in and play. And this, Listen, this is Dak Prescott's team. On the field, in the locker room, wherever you want to talk about, across the board, he is the guy, much like Troy Aikman was the guy in the 90s. Well, I appreciate your honesty in, in breaking it down from a locker room perspective the way that you did. And I think it's important to, remember, to make sure we, we remember this. Dak Prescott is a leader. It's clearly his team. We've got a lot to be proud of when it comes to this guy and what he's showcasing. The Dallas Cowboy hater that I am is basically because of the fans. as individuals. They're phenomenal. I'm real proud of them, him and Ezekiel Elliott. But let's also point out, the versatility aspect that you brought up, him being able, to be, being able to communicate with both sides. Because speaking as a black man, and I'm quite sure that Darren will co-sign when I say this, Max and Molly, mm -hmm. it's this. You can be biracial. You can have those experiences. You can be diverse enough to communicate with all folks. Black folks don't have a problem with that. We respect that. What black folks monitor and watch out for is whether or not you're willing to embrace who you are as it pertains to how society perceives you as being. If you are clearly a black man, biracial or not, but you are a black man, but you want to disassociate and distance yourself from your own, mm -hmm. now you have offended us. Yep. Well, we're, because that, and right, that, what you're and talking about, hasn't done that. What you're talking hasn't about done, is that's authenticity. Great. That's right. Are you an authentic person? Right. Because that, you know, someone like that, Prescott, can speak without, we bring up uh, other athletes, Cam Newton is one, Alex Rodriguez was another. When they spoke, a friend of mine said this once, it stuck with me, about A-Rod, when he speaks, 
He's so uncomfortable, it seems, in his own skin, he makes you uncomfortable in yours. Right. In other words, he has not fully internalized what we all want to hear. Mm -hmm. you know, and so he has to consider carefully what he says. But someone who has internalized all the right kind of things, at least the way, the, the, you know, as it's the received wisdom, the, the orthodoxy, the way we want people to sound, Someone who has internalized that, that's really them. They don't have to think so hard about what they say right. because they're authentic. They believe what they say. And so it's a wellspring. But it's not just The wellspring believing. is them. They don't need to edit so but much. It, they say what right. they say and we like it. But it's not just believing it. It's not being afraid to be it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You sure. can believe it wholeheartedly, but still be fearful because of yeah. how you're going to be received. Right. The point when you say authenticity, understand it's twofold. The one part is believing it. The other part is being unapologetic about it and fearless about it because you are who you I are and you're that, cool with that it. Has to do, that has to do with is the righteousness that you hear from someone something that we like? If we like that point of view, yeah. if it's mainstream, then we embrace that person as being authentic and righteous and good. And if it's not something we like to hear, you know, that person is ostracized. But Dak is saying stuff yep. that people like to hear. And I think there's definitely validity in his statement, but he's certainly a special guy and a leader, and it's hard not to root for him, even it's very even hard as not, a cowboy. It's very, even hard, as a cowboy not, it's very hard not to root for him because he he deserves to be rooted for. It's that okay, damn the uniform fans. that does it. All right, let's move it's on. It's that damn uniform. Darren, you will be back with Never. us later. Appreciate you.